Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to a four immediate release panel discussion. I don't even know where we're going to put this in the feeds. Uh, we don't have a panel discussion feed. But this came up as a result of a uh, discussion uh, that Alan Jenkins actually uh, started. And unfortunately, he's not with us. Uh, he got an invitation out. He may join us in the middle. But in the wake of the passing of Steve Jobs, uh, the discussion was, what are the communication characteristics of organizations that are able to survive the passing of their very dominant, very charismatic leaders? Uh, and I remember one of the organizations, for example, that Alan was talking about was the Walt Disney Company. Uh, Walt Disney uh, ruled that organization uh, from the creative end, his brother Roy from the financial end, uh, with a pretty iron fist. Uh, and uh, joining us for this discussion, obviously, uh, my co-host, Neville Hobson, uh, but also Chip Griffin from Custom Scoop, and Jennifer Waugh, who was uh, also joining in this discussion on Twitter, had some really good observations. And uh, Jennifer, Chip, great to have you both here. Great to be Thanks here. Thanks for the invitation. So, why don't we just uh, start? Uh, and, and again, you know, our focus, as always on FIR, is communications. So, uh, what do you think uh, are are the communication characteristics of organizations that outlast uh, the founder and uh, the, this this really uh, dominant leader? And Chip, you had a, a blog post where you addressed some of these issues. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, that Steve Jobs created a, a culture that, w from a communication standpoint, that was very different from what a lot of us in the, the communications industry would say are best practices, right? I mean, that, that he eschewed uh, transparency and disclosure uh, right up until the end, really. I mean, uh, you know, other than the, the little bit of a heads up that his resignation gave, nobody knew for certain that his health had declined so precipitously. Um, you know, they've restricted access to information repeatedly, determined exactly who can report what. Uh, they've gone after leakers very aggressively, including using lawsuits. Um, you know, the, so Steve Jobs was a rule breaker when it came to communications. And so that, I would say, is the, the culture that he's, he's created at Apple. And so the question is, has that culture been solidified in such a way that it will continue forward? Uh, you know, I think that when you look at organizations that survive uh, the loss or departure of, of uh, you know, larger than life figures, uh, as the case is with Apple, you have to ask yourself, uh, are they positioned to do it because of the culture that's been created, or are they positioned to do it solely because of that individual? And my personal uh, estimation here is that the culture is strong enough at Apple to survive this. Yeah, I would agree, and I'll add to that, Chip, and I agreed with many of the points in your blog post. Um, so when we talk about the characteristics of leaders, um, in organizations, in iconic leaders in organizations like Apple, like Disney, uh, Walmart would be another example. Um, I think Alan cited uh, um, another example in uh, Scandinavia that I can't remember the name of right now. Um, but so my passion is storytelling, and I would argue that in fact those leaders, those iconic leaders, and the cultures they create, they create, are ones that revolve around. Um, a starting point story and an ongoing story. So there's no question. We 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 all know the story of Steve Jobs and and Steve Wozniak in their basement, and you know people hang on to that story and then they build the story as they go. So I would agree with you that Apple's story is compelling enough to survive Steve, and that those organizations um, that have survived the departure of iconic leaders by death or otherwise are ones that have invested in that story whether that story is as con tightly controlled as it has been with Apple or not right like some of those stories are sort of running ramshot all over the place other stories are pretty tightly scripted but um, you know I think those kinds of places attract like minds and so if you go to work at Apple you know that Steve Jobs is both a rule breaker and a rule holder <laughs> And you've got to be cut from the little bit of from the same cloth in order to know you're going to fit in there. That's it. That's. I think that's very interesting. And, and everyone I know is saying similar things, Jennifer. Actually, but I'm, I guess I'm wondering, and I guess we all, you all are too. I suspect is is will that continue? Will will that be how Apple continues uh, in terms of um, how it operates? This omerta of science is a phrase I've seen a lot. Indeed, as I mentioned when we were chatting earlier, Shell and I have talked about this on FIR. I've written about it in my blog too. That um, the 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 kind of 
uh, organizational uh, persona is built around Steve Jobs. Uh, and I guess as an observer, just simply looking at what happens at Apple, has happened at Apple, in terms of um, enforcing that culture that Chip pointed out in, in his really good post. I've seen others commenting on this now uh, as the days are passing since, uh, since Steve Jobs died last week. The question to my mind is there's, there's absolutely nothing to suggest that that will continue like that. Equally, there's nothing to suggest at the moment it will change either. So we don't know. But I would be amazed, frankly, if, um, if this continues like that. Uh, I, I think particularly if the pressures on Apple, the competitive pressure on Apple in the marketplace, uh, let's say the, some of the comments I've seen after the launch last week of the announcement of the Apple, uh, the, the iPhone 4S, less than spectacular because the magician wasn't there doing it. So this is like any other corporation launching a product. It needs to be spectacular in many people's minds, uh, although does, does it really. But uh, you're talking with the fanboys and, and the huge excitement community that's built up around Steve Jobs specifically. And he was a showman without any question. The Economist this week uh, has a truly excellent cover story. Uh, in fact, the cover is of Steve Jobs on the magician that was Steve Jobs in how he was able to engage with people on the most spectacular scale and carry people with him. Uh, he's now gone. He, there is no one at Apple who could do that. Tim Cook uh, uh, is competent without any doubt it seems, but he doesn't have the magic. So will that affect uh, what happens at Apple? Will that be instrumental in any in changes that come? And these are questions. I, I'm not saying they will or they won't. No one knows that. But I would be very surprised, frankly, uh, if Apple is able to continue uh, with the, the magic of Steve Jobs now in, the, in a kind of virtual sense. I, I can't see how they could do that even. And I don't know whether they've got anyone uh, at, at, in a leadership role who has that evangelical magical touch to carry them through. That, that's, that's what I'm seeing. So the question for me is, what is going to happen? Can they um, uh, maintain their position in light of the change that is thrust upon them through Steve Jobs' departure? And what the marketplace is looking like right now, it's, it looks to me to be, uh, if I'm, you know, I'm looking now speaking from an investor point of view, and I don't have any investments in Apple, I would add, but if I did, I'd be looking at this with very, very, very closely as to what will happen with Apple now. That's how I see it. Well, I think, you know, one of the interesting things to look at is you know, how strong the culture needs to be as opposed to any individual leaders. Uh, so, if, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned Walmart. Uh, which has gone through uh, some leadership changes and yet continues to be a very strong organization based on the culture that the leader established. Uh, the same is true, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, Home Depot. Uh, he developed uh, the, the big box retailer for uh, uh, hardware and, and home repair and do-it-yourself uh, on, a, on a spirit of entrepreneurialism. And yeah, I know that the people, even the ones who wear the orange aprons in the stores, continue to do that. But then you look at Hewlett Packard. Um, here were two guys who developed a very strong culture. People studied the HP way. The HP way was taught in management schools. And I was talking to somebody recently who consults over at Hewlett Packard, which has gone through I mean, just, just some terrible times. Mm -hmm. And I asked if the HP way is, is still evident at Hewlett Packard. And what I was told was absolutely not. It is completely gone. Uh, this is a company on the ropes that, you know, it seemed to, to thrive and survive for a while uh, after the passing of uh, Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett, but um, and doesn't seem to be doing that well now. Well, let's draw a direct parallel to Microsoft and Bill Gates, who... Yeah. Um, that who does you know a company that arguably was also built around a very strong persona and and an, and an equally compelling story. Um, now Bill Gates orchestrated his departure over the space of two years, so that was a much more gradual drop off. Uh, in fact, I don't even personally recall the moment in which he was gone um, because Microsoft because Microsoft became Bill Gates and Bill Gates became you know went on to live his life. So um, there's an example of where it worked. Um, another example would be Starbucks. Uh, Howard Schultz, who left and then had to come back. I mean, the same thing happened with Steve Jobs, but uh, I got to interview Howard Schultz a couple of years ago for an alumni magazine I work on. And, uh, and he was, at the time, um, it, he was new back into the job and was not entirely thrilled that the plan that he had previously set in place wasn't working. 
I don't. I haven't actually followed the story intimately since then, so I don't know whether he's been able to get that back on track. But I, I do think there is a, a desire among many of these leaders. I don't know whether Steve Jobs would be included in that to imprint that culture in a way that it it could um, it could continue on without. Well, you know, I, I think one of the thing, the important things is since our focus here is communications is to look at Steve Jobs' role and why he was so significant. And I, and I would argue that he was so significant not because he was a great communicator, but because he was a great leader. And there is a there is a difference there. And I think that there are perils for Apple, but they're more on the business side than on the communication side. I think from a communication standpoint, they've instilled the kind of culture that you need to have. I mean, Steve, people listen to the, the keynotes from Steve Jobs not because he was just a mesmerizing person to listen to. Uh, you know, you, he's not a Ronald Reagan or a Bill Clinton or something like that where you would just listen to him speak about a cup of coffee and it would be great to listen to, right? I mean, they listened to him because of what he was introducing and because of the vision that he had. And so, I, you know, I think that there are threats to Apple, but I think it's less on the communication side and more on the business side. I think you're right, Chip, uh, and in fact, you, you're right to, to, to remind us of the focus of this discussion, which is primarily communication, although I, I don't think you can separate it from, uh, you know, things we have discussed in terms of uh, what the future might hold. But let me quote you a, a, a something from, from a, a feature that appeared in, in a lot of the newspapers, certainly here in the UK, uh, about 18 months ago, called Steve Jobs, the man who polished Apple, uh, an interview by a journalist over here uh, that contains something, I, I blogged about this, which is why I remember it. Let me just read you this little piece that, that really, I think, will help us focus on that point. Uh, it says here that, that secrecy of one of, what is one of Apple's signature products, a cult of corporate omerta, the mafia code of silence is ruthlessly enforced with employees sacked for leaks and careless talk. Executives feed deliberate misinformation into one part of the company so that any leak can be traced back to its source. Workers on sensitive projects have to pass through many layers of security. Once at their desks or benches, they're monitored by cameras and they must cover up devices with black cloaks and turn on red warning lights when they're uncovered. The secrecy is beyond fastidious and is in fact insultingly petty and political, says one employee on the anonymous corporate reporting site Glassdoor.com and often is an impediment to actually getting one's work done. Now that, in my, to my mind, is, is, is the culture at Apple and that was obviously not just down to Steve Jobs. Uh, but we see that in, in uh, Apple's behavior uh, from a communication point of view and how they communicate, what they communicate. You see little glimmers of things that are done for whatever reason, I'm not sure. You probably remember uh, last year, uh, maybe it was the year before, uh, Steve Jobs starting or well, publishing something that people were saying was a blog post. It wasn't, of course, but it was in his own words, and that was unusual. But that didn't last long. Uh, so you've got this culture, if this is uh, it's, it's typical, and I've seen others commenting on, on things very similar to this, so I would say it probably is, uh, which may well transcend Steve Jobs' departure, in which case, are we going to see anything different from the communication point of view? Again, who knows, but this doesn't look as though this is a company who uh, is ready to change this, I wouldn't think. Well, you know, if you look at it too, I mean, that's actually an easier culture to perpetuate. Mm -hmm. than one in which you had been, you know, open and discussing a lot of things. I mean, silence is relatively, you have to enforce it, but, you know, it's, it's not the same as figuring out exactly what to say. So the fact that they went in that direction actually makes it easier from a communication standpoint to continue it going forward. Yeah, and just to rewind to your point, Chip, um, about, and, and you, Neville, the, the intertwining of business and communications and the legacy that leaders leave on that front. I, in fact, I think this is a fascinating case study that I know we'll all be watching for some time because uh, one could argue that that the companies, the, the organizations that do survive the departure of an iconic leader are the ones where a communications culture is very clearly defined and entrenched. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a culture at Apple. I remember talking to one person who said that uh, People rehearsed in the mirror the speech they would give if they en ever ended up in an elevator with Jobs because he would turn to them and say, what do you do for me? Uh, and he wasn't okay. looking for a job title. Uh, he, was, he was looking for what do you do uh, to you know, contribute to the success of the organization and support my goals uh, as, as the leader of the organization. And people were, you know, lived in terror of ending up in that elevator and having to get this right. 
Um, and, and that, you know, we're not talking about employee newsletters or the Internet, but it's certainly a, 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 a communication culture that you have to wonder if it's going to continue under, under Tim Cook, who probably has a different approach to you know, the way he interacts with employees. Uh, whereas you look at somebody like uh, a Sam Walton uh, at Walmart, uh, where the communication culture is, is spread more throughout the organization and not so much hinged on him, even though he's the one who inspired the culture to be that way. I would say that the, the, what you've outlined uh, is interesting, and, and if you connect that to that little piece I read from that publication I mentioned, it seems to me that um, pro the probability is high that the, the control, the restrictive aspect, the secrecy of Apple is very much ingrained. As Chip noted, and I agree with Chip, that makes it hard, easy to maintain and hard to change it, but there has to be a will to change it, and maybe there's nothing... Uh, there, that is an incentive for anyone to change it. Yet, let me temper that by saying, you know, it's early days. Only a couple of days since um, since the passing away of Steve Jobs. <coughs> Excuse me. Lots of commentary. No one knows what's going to happen. Apple are not saying it much. The succession plan is there one? Well, from a leadership point of view, sure. Tim Cook's now got the top spot. Is that going to continue? All these are unknowns. I think the the uh, the competitive position in the marketplace is what will drive. Uh, uh, change that, in my opinion, has to come to Apple uh, to uh, sweep away this this kind of culture uh, that is identified with Steve Jobs, who who is not here anymore. It's not. It's not actually. It's not like you know Bill Gates, as you mentioned, uh, Jennifer. Uh, it's simply because he's still around. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Steve Jobs is not anymore, so they can't go back to the source any longer. So they might have, uh, in fact, Chip, uh, an incentive to change. They may well think, okay, now is the time we can do this. For all we know, there's, you know, there's a lid kept on on this secrecy and this behavior because Steve Jobs was there. Now he's no longer there. Will it change? I can't imagine a company like this. Uh, with with the passing of the magician of of this iconic leader, uh, could continue the way it has done for years under that leader because of that style. He he enforced it. He personally, I would say, uh, does that mean that all those other folks therefore will continue? Well, again, we don't know that, but I I, I can't imagine it could be. But I do believe market conditions are what are going to drive change in Apple, well, not, not anything else. They'll have to change. To let, let me ask a question of all of you, uh, and, and you know, as I've been reading all of the tributes and and. Uh, reporting uh, on Jobs' life, uh, you know, the, the, the overarching characteristic of his leadership was this commitment to insanely great. Uh, it was, uh, in, in fact, I was struck, uh, and I'd read this before when he said it, and it's been raised again in, in all of the obituaries and, and the tributes, uh, a statement he said, he said, it's not up to the customer to know what they want. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're the ones who are going to figure out what the customer wants, and then we're going to engineer it to this, this level of greatness. I made a point uh, in a post here on Google+, Plus where I said, you know, his genius was in identifying a market uh, and then producing a product that everyone was going to want, not innovating a category, because smartphones right. existed before the iPhone, mm -hmm. the Trio was, uh, MP3 players existed mm -hmm. before the iPod. Uh, in fact, I have... Uh, an original Diamond Rio, uh, and I had a personal jukebox before that. Uh, Bill Gates was out there trying to get the, the tablet going before uh, Apple was even thinking about it. And, and even the graphical user interface that was uh, introduced to the public on the Mac was something that Jobs saw when he was touring uh, Xerox Park. It had been developed by uh, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Yeah. So it's not like they innovated these products from scratch. But they identified the potential for a market that didn't exist and then took that product to the next level to make it something really desirable to, the pro uh, to, the, to, the, to that market. Um, and that was all jobs. Uh, what would they need to do, in, in your view, and we'll take you one at a time, uh, in, in order to maintain that kind of an approach to business? Chip, why don't we start with you? Yeah, well, you know, I think you make a great point there, and, and essentially what what they've done over the years is they've taken a look at a product and they said, okay, this is a good start. But if I were starting over, if I, you know, if I could go back to the beginning when they created this product, how would I have done it differently? And as a product guy myself, I mean, I, I've worked on this a lot, you know, in my entrepreneurial life. Uh, it, it's one of the things I often look at my own product and say, if I were building this today, what would I do differently now than two, five, ten years ago? And that's a really smart way to look at it, I think, because you're not you're not going out there and, as you say, trying to create a new category. Creating a new category is very risky and, and very difficult to do. But coming up with a new way to imagine that category is much easier to do. And so I would encourage them to continue to do that. Take a look at products that 
just aren't quite there, right? I mean, you know, look at tablets. Tablets weren't quite there. Uh, and then the iPad came along because they figured out what needed to be done to take it up to that next level. And I think if they continue to do that, everything else will fall into place. You know, I agree with Chip's points from a, from a business development and entrepreneurial perspective. From a communications perspective, you know, I'm a Kool-Aid drinker. I've, you know, I'm an iPhone user. I'm an i, my iPad, my iPod. All, all the eyes are around my house, and um, so I think one of the compelling aspects to Apple that has served it well is the way in which those of us who buy into it or who who are consumers of the product feel part of the story. So. Even even that branding, the iPod, iPad, I you know, and so on and so on. Um, I am invested in that. If Apple can continue to make me the consumer feel that I'm part of the story and do that by both creating innovating products that anticipate my needs and my and, and anticipate where the story is where my story is going and do that from an internal perspective in terms of capturing some magic. The magician is gone. You're right, Neville. Gone, gone. But there is some magic to be captured in um, that old silk hat, they say. Um, so I think if they can find a way to tap into the, the energy that employees, uh, that the culture has ideally tapped from Steve, then uh, I think they'll, they'll succeed. Um, well, I think that confirms what I what I still think. Interesting points of view, without any doubt. I think, though, that they have lost that magic, and the they need to be thinking of the next thing after the iPad, uh, the next thing, because they they are now they they they've brought a market. They have evolved all of this to the state where there are now many products like this on the market. There's only one Apple iX. There's only one of those, and it is you know, the most gorgeous one. It is a design of excellence and has a price premium. Great. But it still will be niche, I, I think, uh, unless they come up with something that is the next wow thing. And that was only Steve Jobs who did that. Do they have another magician in the wings? There's no indicator of that, and I doubt they do. In which case, Apple will survive. I'm pretty certain they'll continue to make the most beautiful products, but the magic is gone. Okay, well, I think that's uh, 22 minutes according to my timer, which uh, sounds about right for uh, people sitting and watching something like this. So I'll let everybody get back to their Sundays. Jennifer, to your uh, Thanksgiving feast. Thank you, uh, Shell. And happy Thanksgiving to you. And Thank uh, you. thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. So much. Thank you.